good. That's good. So. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next uh, talk uh, of the morning. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce you Luis Pedro Coelho. Luis Pedro Coelho is the principal investigator of uh, uh, the big data biology lab in Funden uh, University in Shanghai. And uh, he works with this group with very huge uh, data sets of in computational biology. Uh, he's, uh, he's with us since the very beginning, 12 years ago, and it's my great pleasure to introduce him. So uh, please. Uh, Thank you. Here. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so I'm just going to leave this for a couple more seconds. So if you want to get the slides, everything I'm going to be presenting, it's on this URL. So I'll leave it for a couple more seconds there. Um, yeah, so, so um, this is an introduction to Python. So, so I actually think that, as Fernando said, we've been doing this since the beginning and the summer school has always been in Python. But in actually in the time we've been doing it, Python became much, much more popular in the field. So actually, I, I think that now when we, when we started it, most people in, in machine learning and related disciplines were still using other programming languages, but I think now Python has, has become the standard. And so I will actually basically in, encourage you that if, I think for many people, if, if basically if you can read this code and if you find that this is absolutely obvious what it's doing, then, you know, um, it's not a particularly lovely day. It's a bit cloudy, but you know, but you, please, please just, you know, feel free to take this hour and a half and go have a walk or have some coffee. Um, and, you know, other, otherwise, if you, if you think this kind of makes sense, but maybe some of the details, it's a little bit confusing, then please stay and listen to me talk for the next, uh, for the next hour and a half, uh, more or less. So, all right, I'll get, all right, I'll put up the, yeah, yeah that's it. Right, okay. Um, yeah, so as, as I said, this is an introduction. So we're going to assume that you know at least a little bit of programming. Um, you know, if you don't, if you, if you don't know what a for loop is, this will act, this will probably be a bit too much. Um, if you if you know what a for loop is and you you know what NumPy is and you understand what's being shown here, then this will be a bit too slow. Uh, in which case, yes, please. You know, I I don't I I'm just going to give it a couple seconds so that the noise doesn't. Yeah, so, yeah, so today is what we call day zero, meaning that, you know, it's sort of to, to get everyone up to, to the level at which they can then do the, you know, the actual machine, the actual novel machine learning part of the school. Um, also, the, as you probably noticed, there's an issue with the AC in this room. So it's also helpful for the, for the people who do benefit from the lecture if the room is not as full um, and hopefully then not as hot and humid. Okay. All right, okay. So, so I actually like to start off introducing, so before I get to the actual Python programming language, I, I like to start off with a little bit of history um, and a little bit of what maybe, you know, the philosophy and why Python was created. And that still justifies, you know, why it looks like it, it looked um, like it is. So, so it's now a very old language. Um, and actually before Python, there was a, another language that was called ABC um, and ABC was, was a teaching language. So the idea was, you know, students would come um, to university. Um, back then it was very unlikely that students would have had any programming before, you know, personal computers were still not uh, as pervasive. And so, and they would learn ABC, you know, and ABC was very easy to teach, very simple. Um, but afterwards you would learn quote unquote, a real programming language with which you could do real work. Uh, you know, so in back then, you know, Pascal or C. And so, and so there was this, there was this great language for teaching, very easy, um, but you couldn't really do any work. And then there were these languages like C that, we, that were usable in, in industry, but they were very hard to teach. And, and sort of the, sort of the research program of Python 
because this did start at the university was can we can we have a language that's still really easy to teach like ABC was, but that is also powerful enough that you know that students can then keep using it and and use it you know eventually in their in their working pro, uh, professional lives. And so so in, in that sense, I mean it's it's been you know an incredible success because um, as as I'll, as you'll see, um, it is still very easy to teach. I can still go through almost all of the language in in an hour. Um, and at the same time, it's one of the most widely used languages all across, um, you know, in all domains. So it's it's an open source language, always been. And, you know, and there's different ways in which you can quantify what's the most widely used languages. But Python is generally up there. Okay, so how does it look like? And, and so actually, so here I'm showing this as slides, but I'm actually going to be this is actually something called the Jupyter Notebook, which I'm going to show here. Um, right. And and this this is what you can download if you go to the GitHub address. So what does it look like? So here is Hello World. It's print, and you can see print shows up in green, and then parentheses, then quotes Hello World, and this prints Hello World. Um, if you if you look, at, you know, here is a slightly more complicated example, and here I'll, I'll just let it. So if you let it sit there for a couple of seconds, or you can look at it, and if you so if you've done any programming um, in any language, you can probably guess what this does, um, and you would be perfectly right. So so this is so Python. There's this quote that people. Attribute to Bruce Eccles, not clear if he was the one who said it, but yes, that this is ex executable pseudocode. So it's very, very close to pseudocode. Very little um, extraneous um, syntax needed and just and just kind of does what, what you'd expect it to do. So here, here, so what I'm using here is a so-called Jupyter notebook. Um, and so where you can see that there's these blocks of code. Um, so this is here, this is a block of code or a cell. And then there's these other types of blocks that are just text. And here actually this is markdown text so I can even style it a little bit. So for example, here's A equals one. So this sets A, the name A to refer to the object one. So this. I execute this and I can execute it and I can execute it in different ways. I can go up here, cell, run cell. I can click here the run button or I can, and this is what I've been doing is I can um, click shift enter and this executes. So when you can see here, so the cells are not independent. So this cell A equals one sets the value A and then the next cell prints A, which was set before. And, and here's one thing that can get really confusing really, really fast is that, so if I set A equals two, now A is two. And so if I print A again, it prints two. So the, the order of execution is not necessarily, it's the order in which you've, I've clicked the buttons and not necessarily the order in which things are displayed on the screen. So this gets really, this can get really confusing really fast. Um, as always, there's a solution for everything, which is you know just start, start from scratch. Um, so you start from scratch. So here, there's this restart thing, or I can go kernel restart. So restart. And, I'm going to say restart and clear output, and now it starts from scratch, and there's nothing. All right, so now I can run, now I run it again. And, and you can see that, the, so the numbers here can kind of help you. So this is one, two, three, four, but this is, <coughs> yeah, but this is, this is how it works. Um, the, you don't have to use Jupyter. So everything I'm presenting, you know, it's also, you can use a traditional um, text editor like VI or Emacs, or you can use, um, Visual Code, or you can use there's, so there's whatever whatever if you, whatever you're using nowadays probably supports Python. Okay, so with that, 
I'm now going to go over the basic. So I'm first going to go over the basic Python language, um, and then over over some of the libraries that we use in in machine learning or more generally numeric programming. Okay, so let's do types. So the first type, the first type is numbers. So integers. So syntax a equals one. So sets the name a to refer to one. Um, type, so Python is a type language, so A is now an integer, but the types are implicit. Um, so there's also floating point numbers. So floating point 1A equals 1.2, B 2.4. And now you got a floating point result, 9.84. So if you mix floats and integers, then you get, you get the float back. So, so here A is an integer. B is and C are floats, you mix everything together, and then you get 13.0. So 13.0, so this is a floating point number that happens to have an integer value, but it's still a floating point number. Okay, so A plus B, A minus B, A times B. So those do what you expect. Um, there's exponentiation, A to the power of B is written as A times times B. So and minus a just flips the sign. Okay, so these are all probably very easy. Uh, these all work, including it's, you can do uh, floating point exponents and it does what it should do. So the question, the question of what about division? So division gets a bit more complicated because you know, if I ask what's nine divided by three, okay, three, that was the answer. But if I ask what's 10 divided by three, then it, it's actually a little bit more ambiguous because now there's actually two different answers. One is the one that we learn in grade school, which is 10 divided by three is three with reminder one. So we've divided it with int as integers. And the other one, the other answer is that it's, it's three and a third or, or in floating point numbers, 3.333. Um, and so in Python, we have both types. So, the, so there's this integer division, which is spelled divide, divide. And then there's this traditional floating point division which is spelled, which is just, or the, just the divide sign. So this forward slash uh, does the, oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, is this better? Yes, oh, oh yes, sorry. This is probably much better in the back. All right, so if you do A times, A, A divided by B, this is, in, this is the floating point division. All right, so, so that was numbers. So let's do strings. Okay, syntax. So you have you can use single quotes or double quotes. So it, so here's this is a string that goes from single quote to single quote or double quote to double quote. Um, they're exactly equivalent. There's absolutely no difference except that if you start with a single quote, you have to end with a double quote. If you start with a double quote, you end with a double quote. Um, same. Yeah, so this is what's this. So everything has to be in the same line. And if you're coming from a language like, um, I mean, most languages, most languages, but you know, anything in the C family, you'll probably have seen any these escape sequences. So slash n refers to a new line, um, slash t refers to a tab, and there's a bunch of other ones that I probably don't even remember. All right. So here, print. We've seen the print function. Parenthesis calls a function, and th these are exactly the same. So single quote, single quote. It's, and here slash n gives you a, a line. Okay, all right. So, um, all right. So here, and this is actually so this this is actually one of the areas of Python that where things have have changed throughout the years, and actually I think we've we've changed. Um, this is. I've changed this. Uh, this is one of the few changes for this year's is that uh, I'm presenting this thing called F strings. So F stands for formatting. Um, and so here, all right, let, let's do step by step. So here, username is a, is a variable that now refers to this string. That's my typical username. Um, last login. So first A is one, B is two. And now here I'm gonna print and this is an F, literally the letter F. Um, the, the, the F, and then double quotes or single quotes, it would be the same thing. 
And then I write the string and then I can use these angular brackets to interpolate. And here I can interpolate variables from the variables and, and including even more complicated expressions. So here I can do a little bit. So this prints A plus B and this is gonna do, yeah, this just builds up the string where it puts in the variables from, from there. And, and in more recent versions of Python, there is even, there's even a, a couple of, um, yeah, there's, there's even this variation where if you write variable name equals, it prints it, you know, this is, this is helpful for debugging. And this is basically the purpose. Um, so th this is fairly new. This is this is the last few years. You might also typically see see this other way of doing things, which is using the format method explicitly. Um, and here, we, all right. I'll start again with syntax. So you know, here's a string. This is a string from single quote to single quote, or sorry, from double quote to double quotes. And here you can see these brackets. These are sort of the special special things that are going to get replaced and then dot format uh, so we're calling the format method and then here giving it as an argument a string uh, and then this one gets replaced there um, and then we can have multiple ones so you have the place for the zero element and the place for the first element or the element one um, and you'd have multiple arguments for the format so, and we're gonna see this throughout. So Python uses zero based indexing. So the first element of something is the zeroth element. Uh, so, okay. Um, one, one, uh, you can actually leave the numbers out. So, so, you, so this here, so if you see like open angular bracket, close angular bracket, the, the way to read this is that, you know, you, you'd see the first one is zero. And then, and then if there's more, it's gonna be one. And if there would be more, it would be two. And so basically it's just the order in which things appear. So there's no really, it's just a, a, a just a shorthand. There's really no magic to that. Okay. Um, all right. So, that, so this was, there's one, one other thing. So there's something called the long string um, and you'll see it, it, it starts with triple quotes. And again, you can start triple single quotes or triple double quotes. Uh, and then it's called a, a long string because it can go over multiple lines. And here you can see by the by the coloring scheme that this whole thing is now a single string. And you know, there's there's really again no magic to it. It just prints out this little limerick from Kurt Wall. But so there's nothing special here. All right. Uh, if there's any questions at any moment, please do feel free to interrupt. Or I'll be a I'll ask for questions. Uh, yep, so please. Do you have like a stuff like using all uh double like that's like another way to buy both of them? Um yeah, so I so here I've been using them interchangeably to make the point that they are um literally the big advantage of the double quotes is that you can then use the single quote to do the apostrophe. So in English, so if you're doing isn't or I I'm, but from the point of view of the language, it there's absolutely no difference. There's it's there's um, yeah I, I, the double quotes. It's easier to write in English because sometimes you want to use the apostrophe. That's literally the one thing I. Yeah. All right, okay. So, so so we've so we've seen the base types or we've seen numbers and strings. Um, so so lists are containers. So here I'm going to start syntax. So so now this square bracket. Um, then a bunch of things with commas and square bracket. So it goes from square bracket to square bracket separated by commas. And this is a list, um, a list in, and then to access the list, you, you use again. So here are the list, square bracket and index, close square bracket. The first one is zero. Um, the second one is index one. So we so this is a we've seen before. So everything everything is always going to be indexed by zero. So this this is very standard. One thing that may be not so standard is that you can also count from the end. 
So if you so minus one is one from the end. So here in this case, it's going to be ten. And len is how it's short for length. So len tells you the length of the list. But more generally, you're going to see that length can be used the number of elements in a thing. So it, there's going to be a lot of things with, with elements, and length is the length um, of them. So so we've we've actually seen this in the form when we saw the format. So we, you know we so there's this the syntax again as it many many programming languages where if you object dot method parentheses you can call a method on the object. So here's a list, and here you can see again the list. Here we have strings inside the list. So close, open bracket close bracket strings with. Um, strings with double quotes and then we can call the sort method um, and now you know it's sorted alphabetically um, we can methods can can also append things append to a list adds to the end of the list and then now we have here and then as an aside um, and here oh here I have to you know, I have to do this by hand because it's, um, so this is this happens in this this is this is not the Python thing. This is a Jupyter thing. Although some of the other some of the other um, there's also something called IPython, which is the command line version, also has the same thing, um, which is you can add if you add a question mark, um, it it sort of looks up the help. So so here fruit sort and fruit sort and here uh, you know. It actually can it takes it can take these arguments um, so for example the key is, is I can tell it how to sort if, um, or I can tell it to reverse sort and then here you know there's a bunch of English language explanation of what's happening sort the list in ascending order okay so this so if you put in the question mark then it looks for help and actually and maybe you've noticed this so the hash sign um, is how you how you do uh, comments. Okay, so so a list can contain mixed types. So there's no so there's no type checking. So fruits was our list of fruits, but I can add one the number one hundred and twenty three, and it just adds. So there's no checking that the types are you can you can and you can have you know lists of lists. You can have complex things. Um, so we, this is great and excellent because you, you can do all of this complexity. Um, it can also you can also you know shoot yourself in the foot because there's no checking that you are that things are coherent. Um, and so, so for example, here I think I think now. Oops, sorry. I think so. The type checking happens. I think now, for example, if I try to sort, it's going to tell. I think it's going to tell me it cannot sort. Yeah. Now it's going to tell me you cannot sort because now I'm trying to sort strings with numbers with lists and so so you, so the, all of the error checking is done at you know when at um, dynamically at runtime um, so yeah this is this is the trade off with these types of very flexible languages okay let's going to keep going so dictionaries all right so here's here's one. Um, and I, so I'll start with syntax as usual. So here, curly brace, curly brace, the curly brace, and then something, something, something. So this is a string, colon, something else, comma, something colon, something else, comma. So so this is this is a dictionary, which is what other languages call a hash map or a map or a hash table or so. So this is. This is now a, a mapping from these things that we're going to call keys to a value. So, and we can access basically the same the same syntax as we use with lists. So, you know, um, square bracket to square bracket, except that now we can have um, we can, we can have more complicated keys and not just numeric indices. By the way, this is my this is my actual email. Um, if you know, if if you have any questions, you can email me. All the other emails are made up, but this, but mine are actually real. Um, to work with dictionaries, so the, we can assign to dictionaries 
with using this square bracket syntax. So here's a dictionary, square bracket, the key, um, and and the the syntax to to add an element or to replace an element is the same. So if the key already exists, then you know whatever was there goes away. Um, if the key doesn't exist, then you have a new element. So here's um, yeah. This is this is also my other email. Um, whilst the whilst the other two stay in here, Petra where now has a new. Name. We can also call the function len. So it now tells the length of the dictionary is the number of elements. Okay, so so there's a bunch of dictionary methods that would also do you know do what you you know what you'd expect. So if you want to check whether something is in a dictionary, the methods exist for that. So just you can you can look that up um, if you need it. Um, so there's something called none. It's spelled n o n e capital n lowercase. Um, and it does absolutely nothing, but it's often useful as a null pointer. It's useful as a placeholder, so we'll, you'll see it show up again and again. It just it's just something that's there, um, often to signify you know it, it, that, that something is missing or to leave something absent. Okay. All right. So, all right. So let's let's now look at control structures. So we've we've seen the basic types. We've seen um, our in Python, so the so control structures in here. Can we give a couple of seconds? You can probably guess what this does, right? If blah blah blah, else blah blah blah. Um, but 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 that, all right. Let's do syntax. So here we have if, which is a keyword, and you can see that on on Jupyter it shows up in a different color and bold, and then something something something, and then a colon. And then you have here this you have here this indentation. So there's just some space at the beginning, and then you have multiple lines indented um, until you know until the end, where now else is not indented, else again keyword colon, and now a block indented. And so this does exactly what you'd expect, which is if this condition is true, then this block gets executed, else. You know the other block gets executed. Um, actually, this isn't. This is. This isn't. Well, I, I think I've had this. Um, um, this, this is now less and less true because this is being copied a lot. Um, so, but in in Python, blocks and a lot of structure is defined by the indentation. So it's defined by the by how much white space you leave at the beginning of the line. Um, some people, some people call it the offside rule, and the language itself doesn't care how many spaces you should you use, but you should use four, um, because because that's sort of a convention. Um, and actually, so if I if you type on the, so here I actually don't type four spaces, so actually if I, it actually indents four spaces for me. Uh, if I if I type the tab character, it's going to add four spaces every time. If I delete it, it, so all of the tools and all everybody kind of expects four spaces. So the language itself, if you use seven, or even if you even if some if parts of the code use three and others, the language itself will actually be happy with that as long as you you are consistent. Um, but it's weird for everybody else. So please just just use four. Um, also, you can use tabs. Please don't. Um, people, it just it. It's this is more of a, not a language thing, but more of a how the culture of the language has evolved. That you know, so you know when we say a block, we're we're going to do four spaces. So and um, you know and, and this you know and a lot of things are going to be exactly like this. So we have if and then something 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 a condition a colon and then a block. And you can have multiple lines in the block. You can have blocks within blocks, but then they all start four spaces. And then once you're done with that, um, you just go back so that whatever is whatever you have is a, aligns with the original. So so I've said you know I, I said you have if something something something, and there you can you have a condition, um, and you can do the typical comparison. So you can you can see if two things are equals, and that's spelled equals equals, like in, you know, this comes from the C family of languages. So because the because the equal sign is used for assigning values, 
comparing is equals equals. Um, compare something not being equal is you know bang equals. So this means a not equal to b, a less than b, a greater than b, greater equals. Or and this this is actually maybe not so common. You can ask whether a is in a list or not in a list. Uh, and this works for lists, it works for, and it actually also works for dictionaries, in which case it checks the keys. So, um, so you can check whether something is in there. So we saw if um, there's all, but, and we saw else, but there's also else, you can have this else if, which in Python it's abbreviated LF. So if a so the conditions are tested in order. So if a greater than three, else if greater than two, greater than one, and finally else. Um, you don't have to have an else. You can have, you can leave it off. Um, or yeah. so so, but else if is spelled elif. Um, all right. So so now we can do yeah. So now we can do conditions. Um, we should let's let's do loops again. Let, um, no, or let's do loops now. So there's something called the for loop. So when, all right, and again, I'm going to start with syntax. So for then something, and here you, you basically you're choosing a variable name for, and then here you put the variable name, whatever you want to use in, and then some sort of sequence. And here the sequence is a list. So here square bracket to square bracket, the list of strings. Um, colon, and then a block. So again, you know, some sort of special keywords, um, and then a colon, and then the block. So, and this is going to do loop over all of the, execute this block over all of the elements of the list. And each time this variable name that you've defined here is going to refer to one of the elements. So first, second, and third. Um, you can also loop over dictionaries. And here, if you're paying, you see you're looping N over the dictionary, and this is a dictionary of email. So N is going to refer to the keys of the dictionary one by one. So, and then we can use it to index into the dictionary. Okay, so there's also, okay, so this was a for loop. There's also a while loop. I mean, and, and by now, and this is one of the reasons why it's, it's a easy to teach languages because the syntax really is incredibly regular. So the syntax for a while loop is that, you know, you start with the keyword while, then, you know, whatever is something that, that you want to specify as a condition, a colon, you know, and then four spaces to define, you know, the block of text that you'll be executing. Right, so that's here. Right, so this does what you'd expect. So this does, so executes, and then while C is greater than B, then it's gonna do this you know, sort of division uh, by, by, by subtracting it multiple times, and then whatever this is. All right, so, so here I just wanna go over the syntax, so while, while, condition, colon, indentation. All right, so, um, okay, when, so we saw that for loops are, so for loops go over some sequence, um, which is actually very generic and nice. Um, but often, especially in numeric programming, we want if you want to use the these very simple for loops over you know over indices zero, one, two, two, three. Um, we can the way we do it is we use this thing called the special object that's a built-in object called a range. Um, and yeah, so. So this is this is kind of a special type of thing. We're not going to, uh, which allows you to iterate over it and to loop over it, and it goes from from zero to up to, but not including five. Right? So range of five is zero up to and not including five, which is helpful because if you have a, if you have a list of five elements, these are going to be the indices for those for that list. So so zero, one, two, three, four. So a total of five elements starting at zero that go up to, but not including five. Um, okay, so, so we've seen conditions or actually, and, and a lot of the things, you know, 
So a condition is something that's either true or false in some sense. But we can also use the objects. So we can also have these Boolean objects true or false. So which in Python are spelled true with a capital T and everything else lowercase and false with a capital F and everything else lowercase. In the same way we had saw none spelled with a capital N and everything else lowercase. Um, and in the case of the Booleans, we can use them as we can use them directly as values. Uh, so we can have we can have a variable referring to to true. Um, so, so this is often so this is often also helpful in you know when calling functions to have parameters saying this is true, this is false. Um, and but other conditions, many things can be used as a condition. Um, and so typically the rule is if it's some sort of compound object, if it's empty, it's false. If there's anything in it, it's true. Uh, and if it's a number, zero is false. Anything other than zero is true. So a list, um, a list, uh, the empty list is false. A list with anything in it is true. A list, a dictionary, the same rule. A string, again, the empty string is false. Everything else is true. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of other things, um, but these would be the ones that you might encounter. Right. So, yeah, so fruits is, you know, this, um, yeah, this, this list that we had from before, with, and since fruits is not empty, there were a bunch of things in it, um, it it's evaluates to true. Okay, so, so this is, as in other languages, so if we have a for loop, um, there's these two, two special keywords, one is break and the other one is continue. So continue will we'll immediately skip ahead to the next, so to the next iteration of the loop. So this is a very typical usage case. So here we have this, as before, we have this numbers, square bracket to square bracket, um, and we are computing an average by doing the sum and then by doing the sum um, and then dividing, except that we want to skip the negative numbers. So whenever we see a negative number, we continue. So we go immediately to the next one. Here also, and so this syntax plus, plus equals n plus equals one means that you're adding, adding one to the value of n. So here where I was doing total equals totals plus v, this, I can simplify this to total plus equals V. And the other thing here that I'm also showing is that I'm not, even if I don't explicitly print, whatever shows up at the end, it just gets printed on the console as well. So this is, it's almost identical to doing this. Um, all right, so, so that was most, so that's as most as we're going to go over the basics of Python. We're going to just show you how to do, uh, how to build functions. All right, so, so, so far we've actually called functions. We've called print, we've called len, but these, these are, you know, these are built in functions. So here we have, so we also want to be able to define our own functions. And the way we do this is again, the syntax is, is def. So to define a function def, then here we're going to specify the name of the function that we want. Parentheses, you know, we specify here whether we want this function to take any arguments, colon, and then the block. So whatever, so whatever now is indented, this is going to be the body of the function. Uh, and here we start with the string, and then return is going to be the return value of the function. Okay. So, so here. You could probably, I mean, first of all, it's called double, but right. It, so if we call double of three, so we call it, we've, we've been calling functions, so we call it the name of the thing, then the parentheses with the argument three, it returns, it returns six. All right, so, all right, and, and here we have this string um, that says returns double, the double of its argument, right? You know, and is, it's kind of like a comment, but it's a special kind of common, which is, a, it's a documentation string. So what this does is, so we, we have this, we showed you this before, you can do this question mark, 
or in some, you know, if you're using uh, VS Code or one of these tools, often just just um, you double click on something or there's different ways. Which, but if you if you look up the help for that for any function, um, and I saw I showed you before that you you got this little block of text, and there's really what you're getting is you're getting this documentation string. So. So before we saw an example where these things were built into the language, so this sorting, sorting. But in this case, even if it's a function you define yourself, you you define its help. Um, you define what its help text, and um, and so basically, whatever is at the start of the of a function, the, if you put a string right at the beginning, then that becomes part of the function's help, and the, the language has support for this internally. Um, and then depending on which system you're using. So in, in Jupyter, it's with a question mark and some systems you double click or you hover or you right click or whatever. But you know this, this is something that from the point of view of the language, the language does nothing with this. It's really just for, you know, for human consumption. So for whatever, whoever is gonna be using your code, uh, you know, including yourself a bit later when you've forgotten what you were thinking about. And, yeah, so, and, then, and then you can write whatever you want in whatever, you know, here is in English, but you can write whatever other language you think, whatever language you think is useful. All right, so, okay, I think, so we saw this, we saw this, you know, you can call a function with parentheses. Um, thank, so things are, um, are, they're typed, but they're, you know, what, what Python calls, uh, not Python, but what, you know, what programming language people call, you know, duck typing, which means, you know, if it quacks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, then it's a duck. So in this case, what this function needs, it's something that can be multiplied by two. So anything that can be multiplied by two, you know, works. So if you, so if you pass it a, an integer, it works with integers. If you pass it a double, it works with doubles. And we'll see, you know, there's other objects that, you know, could be multiplied by two. Okay, so couple um, so here's another another function that we're defining saying greet right syntax that greet the name that I've chosen parentheses and then arguments separated by commas except the second argument here um, greeting equals hello so I'm giving it a default value and then a colon and then the body of the text so the body of the function so in this case, I can greet Mario. I think he's left, but you know. Uh, so if I greet Mario, I can, so I can call this function in these two ways. I can call it just, just with one argument, which will correspond to the name and the greeting will be the default value, or I can be explicit and call it greeting. Um, we, can also, we can also call functions in this other way where we can be very explicit and say, we're, we're calling the function greet with the arguments, the, the argument greeting equals howdy and the argument name equals Mario. And now the order doesn't matter anymore. Um, you know, and, and for this, you know, for this joke of a function, uh, that's a one line function, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but, to, but there's functions sometimes with, you know, you know, over 10 arguments, um, especially for example, you'll, you'll be using these optimization functions where you might have a, a lot of parameters to the algorithm and you, you will want to use almost all of the default ones, but maybe you want to set two or three of them. And so this syntax here is how you, you know, how you do it, you know, without having to specify all of these arguments. All right, and let's see how we're doing with that. All right, so we're, so here we have a tiny breakpoint. Um, any questions up to this point? So this, you have questions? All right. All right. So if no, so if there are no questions, so so now, so now I want to, um, so now I I, I want to talk about so so this so I've talked about Python the language as a language. Uh, I didn't show I didn't show everything there is, but I think I, I tried to show you the basics. Um, and now I'm so, but so far, you know, the thing is that Python is a general purpose language, you know, unlike R or MATLAB, which are maybe the other languages that people 
often used in machine learning and statistics. Um, Python has is not built to for this domain. It's it's a general purpose language, and so for doing a lot of numeric computation, it does the built-in stuff really is not the best. Um, but there are these libraries, um, and in particular NumPy, that that are again um, they're not standard in the sense that they're not part of the language, but they are standard in the sense that everybody you know everybody uses it. So it's more of a community standard than a, um, so and let me just show you and num, let me just show you maybe an example where so what NumPy mostly provides is it provides this multi-dimensional array of numbers. Okay, so let's start with syntax. Import NumPy as an NP. Uh, so import, you know, it's imports a library, you know, other languages might use include, require, some variation on this. Um, and then here, this this part is optional. Um, but it, it just defines NP as a synonym for NumPy. So, which again is very common. Um, so you'll see, uh, you'll see this synonym a lot. And so now I can refer to np.array to refer to the NumPy array. And so here I'm building an array um, and here's using square brackets and I'm building A as this array of 0, 1, 2, 2, 3, 4. And then I can access it basically like a list, but you know, with a square bracket zero zero, it means you know first first um, column, first row, first column, first row, second second column, uh, second row, first column. So basically, I can you know instead of just being a list that's a one dimensional thing, I, I have two dimensions. Right. All right. Maybe at this point. You know, you could ask, you know, right, but we have we had lists already. So we could we could even have lists of lists. So you know, so yeah, why do we why do we need this extra library? Um, you know, for example, here, so here we have A is an array with the numbers one, two, three, and B is a list with the numbers one, two, three. You know, aren't these basically the same thing? Right? And except that one we have to import the thing, um, maybe. You know, maybe it's more complicated to install an extra library and to re read stuff. Why do we need this? Okay, so so uh, let me let me give you you know a couple of reasons. So the first one is is that arrays are numeric, and so there's a bunch of numeric methods that come built in, right? The, the other, then I'm going to get to efficiency and expressiveness as well. So so a is this array, and I have a function called mean. Which does the average? So, uh, sorry, a method called mean. So, a dot mean mean. So, the method syntax gets mean. STD gets the standard deviation. Max gets the maximum value. So, all of these things are built in, which is great. Um, you can also use numeric operations with arrays, and they work element wise. So, if I do a plus one. Then I add a sorry I add one to the first element, one to the second element, and word third element individually. So and I can do a times times two. I can do all of these division, exponentiation, etc. Um, so if I have two, so if I have two arrays, it's also element wise. So a plus b, it's the first element of a, first element of b, etc. And a times b. It's also the first element times the second element. And this is also why I've always been saying array and not vector, because these are these are not these are these it's because they work element-wise by default. These are not vectors in the linear algebra sense. So if I do a something times something, it's really just um, element, it's element-wise. So if I want to do if I want to interpret them as vectors and matrices, then I you know, I can also do that, but I have to do that's not a default. And I call this I call this other function called dot a dot b, which is a general purpose um, tensor multiplication. So if I if I call it with so in this case I have a is a two dimensional array and b is a one dimensional array. So a dot b is the matrix vector multiplication. 
So, but, or I do NP dot AB. So if I do with two vectors, then it's the vector product. Um, so if I do, I can actually, so if I do P dot B, then the, this is the vector product, uh, the inner product of, uh, yeah. Okay, so, th so this is the first reason for, for why, why uh, arrays are much better than lists is because you do have, you, do, you can do this, uh, this is all built in. You can take the median, you can take the, uh, you can do these numeric operations, you can add an element wise. Um, and with lists, we would have had to do for loops for all of these things. The, the next reason is, you know, is that they can be much, much faster, right? So, right, so this is the memory representation of a list in Python, right? So if you have, if you have, so if you have the list with the numbers one, two, three, basically you have a list of objects and the first object is an integer with type one, or sorry, it's type one, it's type integer with the value one. The second object is type integer with value two. Third object is type integer with value three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we saw before that we could have mixed types. If you have an, an, an NumPy array, what you have is you have something telling you, oh, we have, this is an array of ints, and then one, two, three, is, is a chunk of memory, contiguous chunk of memory. So what this means is, for example, when, when the code has to add to, to, to arise, it's, it's gonna check the types at the very beginning, um, and then it's just gonna process everything without any more type checking because all, all of the types are the same. Um, so for, first of all, computers are really, really good at doing this. So, you know, like the computer, like processing these big blocks of memory, um, Computers can be really, really fast at doing this. Um, and there's also a lot of code out there that's been written in C or Fortran that implements these things. So actually when you're, when you're doing NumPy, so for, you know, when here, when we did the dot product, um, we're actually using code that's not written in Python so that it's written in, actually a lot of it's still written in Fortran. That's very, very optimized uh, and works very well, even with very large matrices. So it's going to be really, really fast. Um, also because you know the code only need to check types at the very beginning instead of every time through the loop making sure that oh you didn't mess up and have you know a banana in the middle of your numbers. Right? And so okay, and so let, let me just maybe show you a little bit. It's also here we can also show you there's um, so this is now this is not a Python specific thing, but this happens. It happens in Jupyter or IPython, or which is you have these magic commands. Uh, here I'm showing one where, so it starts with a percentage sign and then something. Uh, and this, in this case, the time it, so this means it's a command for, you know, for the, for the notebook and not the command, not the Python command. Um, it's so here, time it will run this, it's, it tries to be a little bit smart about it. We'll run this a bunch of times and then tell you how long things take. So I here, you know, this here I've built a list that goes from zero up to 1,024, or up to but not including 1,024. So this is a standard Python list. Um, and then computing the sum takes eight microseconds. If I do a NumPy array, um, okay, then, then computing the sum takes, you know, twice as fast. We, you know, it, it's, it's not that big of a difference still, you know, it's nice. It's a factor of two, but you know, if we, if we now do, you know, even more complex, but if we do much more complex data, so here's, you know, let's do a million elements. And instead of just a sum, we do the sum of squares. Now, you know, now these things, you know, the, now it's more than a factor of 10. Now we have a factor of 20. So as data gets larger, you know, the fact that, a lot of NumPy code, you know, you know, it, it does all of this type checking one time, and then it's very fast, uh, as opposed to having to do, it, to do it each time through the loop means that things can be, you know, orders of magnitude faster. So that's so that's the other reason. So that's the so that's the other reason for um, for for doing it you know, for doing it with NumPy as opposed to to lists, um, you know, and, and then um, yeah, and then if you you have um, the other, the other thing is that this can be either a blessing or a curse is that NumPy arrays are homogeneous. So all of, 
So all of the objects, all of the members of the array have the same type. Uh, it can be either an integer or floating point type. Um, and this is defined when you first create the array. So then, so this can be done here um, implicit. So here we create 0, 1, 2. These are integers. And so a dot d type, d standing for data type, is an integer of 64 bits. Or you, know, you can have floating point types. But you can also be more explicit. And you, know, you can say, you know, I want the d type to be, the data type to be 64-bit you know, floats. Um, and you know, so you can be more, more consistent and expressive. And now you know, it's not going to let you build, you know, it's not going to let you mix and match types. It's going to enforce that. All right, so the data types, um, you have ints and unsigned ints. So, and they have, you know, here you specify how many bits you want. Um, and you have a type pool. All right, so note that this can un underflow and overflow. So that means, you know, if you, so here you have an array of type unsigned integer eight bit. If you subtract 10, um, you know, then, you know, that doesn't work because uns unsigned means, you know, there's no sign. And so it now, the numbers just get, this just gets reinterpreted to, you know, to be 247. So what, uh, you know, like, because eight bits, you, you have to go up to 256. And then just, if you do, if you do the, if you do the math, this is how it works out. All right, so, um, yeah, so, so here you are dealing with things a little bit closer, closer to, you know, to the machine operating. All right, let, let's see how we're doing one time. Okay, I think we're pretty good. All right, so, all right, so, so this is what NumPy arrays are. And this is what we will be using probably throughout throughout the, the summer school. Um, so we so we've so here so we've seen this before. We've seen actually we've seen this. this. We've seen this. Um, you know, we, I can ask what's the maximum value. Let me just. I can ask what's the maximum value in this array, and it's going to tell me that the maximum value is four because that's the maximum value. I can also ask what's the maximum value along an axis. Um, and now this would be the axis zero, which would, so th which would mean it's gonna compress that axis. Um, and so it, it would go and would say, okay, along this axis, so there's a two there, there's a four there, and there's a three there. So it will go along this axis and operate. Or, and here I can do this. Uh, and it's, it's less explicit, I can say, uh, across the axis, it one. So now it goes like this, and here it's one. Oops, sorry. So it's gonna be first a one, then a three, then a four, and then a one again. And this works for all, you know, you know, so, so can, we can do the, the average across an axis. And this seems a little bit artificial, but it's actually really, really useful. So for example, Let's say you have a, a table where you have, say, people, right? And, and you know, and then you, you have maybe for each individual, you have a certain number of attributes, you know, the, you know their age or, you know, um, you know whatever, whatever, whatever other attribute. And then you can, you can do the average across all of the individuals and you get the average age, for example. And, and, and so those things... So those things off, or those things often are very, you know, if you have a, you have some feature matrix asking what's the average feature value, this is a very meaningful and often useful question. Um, all right, so here here's more or less the same. Again, a two-dimensional array, a dot shape gets the shape. So so it's a four by three array. And so we saw this before that you can you can use you can use the square brackets to index. And in this case, A is a two-dimensional array. And if we, here we index it by a single dimension, what we get is a slice of the array. So now we get a two-dimensional array um, and we can just get the one-dimensional array that corresponds to the first row. And here we can see it. And this is now an array with one dimension of size three or the second row or, and this is again, 
syntax. Um, so open bracket, and here you have a colon. Um, and so what this means is now you want you want the array that's where the indices are something, and and then position, and then a two in the second position. And so so this would mean that in this zero two one two three two you know whatever whatever so this would be you know now you are indexing in the other direction so all right, all right so this now this part is really important and this actually differs from a lot of the other languages that that have that have similar concepts which is an array is a view into another array so what does what do i mean by view um and or why what does this term mean it means that it shares memory so if i change so here, A, this is A, and now B is the first row, so it's a slice of A. And now I can, I can change values in B, and this will have changed values in A. So B is, refers always back to A. Um, again, you know, this, this can be incredibly powerful and flexible, um, and you can also shoot yourself in the foot. Um, because you know, especially because of how this interacts with with calling a function so sometimes um you know in this case here it's very obvious because you know the, the code that change the code that's changing the value is right next to the code so this one would be very obvious but what if you call a function so for example here so when we're calling this function double array doubles the values of the array and so when when i give it a, uh, it's actually going to change the values of A. Um, so again, this can be really this can be really useful. Uh, it also means that it, it's really fast because even if A is a huge huge matrix, it just you know it just gets um, when you pass it to a function, the function only gets a reference to it, and so this can be really fast. Um, but you know if it's not what you expected, uh, it you know it can you know you're shooting yourself in the foot. There's in, in case of doubt, or if you if this is not the behavior you want, you, there's also this method called copy, uh, which you can you can call it on a on an array or on a slice or whatever. And so here, again, syntax colon zero, sorry brackets, and then zero colon ten. So this is you know so going from zero up and two, but not including ten, and then I I create the copy. Right, and now, now I have A, which goes from zero up, but not including twenty, and then a copy from the big, from the first ten elements, and then I can operate on that copy, um, and it no longer has any relationship with A. Right, so, um, all right, so, so I mentioned in passing that you can create an array of booleans, <coughs> and. And often, and I also mentioned that you know when you when you operate on arrays, you, you do it element wise. So here you have an array, and you can you can create your you can do the comparison where a is, is a greater than zero, and this is now an element wise comparison. So it's going to compare is the first element greater than zero, second element greater than zero, and it's going to create an array of booleans, some of which are true and some of which are false. Um, and then one of the things that's, it's one of those things that sometimes it's really a little bit confusing the first time you see it, but it's really very, very useful very, very often, which is you, you, can, you can do this even more complicated thing. So A greater than zero and, so this is the ampersand sign, which does then the logical operation and, and A less than zero, or sorry, less than three. And then I can take the mean. And now what this happens is that whatever's false gets interpreted as a zero, whatever's true gets interpreted as a one. And I can do these, I can do these numeric operations with booleans. Um, and I get 0 0.25, which is a fraction. So this is now whatever, which is the fraction of true values. So it's gonna be a number between zero and one, which means that in this case, one in four things fulfill this criteria. So, so, so this might, this, I think some people sometimes when they see it the first time, because we're mixing, we're mixing conditions and then doing numeric operations, 
Um, but if you think that you're doing it, you, you're asking what's the fraction, what's the fraction of values of, that fulfill this condition, then it's actually really, really useful. Uh, it shows up a lot of times. Or an, another way where, where you can use these, these, um, these conditionals is here, A um, being indexed where, wherever A is less than zero, then we set it to zero. Um, and here, another way to do it would be to multiply by A greater than zero. So again, again, you, it seems a little bit odd, but these are very, this is a very this is a very natural operation to want to do to say you know wherever a is less than zero, then you know we set it to zero, or here we'd be multiplying and we'd be multiplying by one, uh, wherever the condition is true, and multiplying by zero where it's not true. So, so we can so whenever whenever we're mixing a condition and we try to interpret it as a number, it becomes zero or one. All right, so. I think all right, I think I think now everything else is is a loop. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, just a, a quick question. Back there where you did the uh, A uh, smaller than zero and, and bigger than three. Why does it uh, why why is it the a percent a symbol instead of the other ten? Okay, that's a good question. Um that's that's a good question. So because the Yes, this is traditional. This is the bitwise end. Uh, yes, traditional. This would be the bitwise end in the case of NumPy arrays because everything is zero or one. So if you think of it numerically, you should always think it's zero or one, and so it, so it ends up corresponding exactly to the logical end, right? Because and true and true is is one and one bitwise with one. That's still one. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I think it's something stupid here. Um, it, it's not going to work actually, um, because so the, the this this is expects that there's a single true and value and true and there's a single boolean, and so it's not going to it's not going to do the element wise thing. That yes yes so yeah the the bitwise one you know it it transforms itself into an element wise thing and so and so it works and so here I could add. so this this part of the expression is 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 doing element wise so for each element in A it's going to be whether it fulfills this condition but the and the yeah the and one it does yeah it just doesn't it doesn't transform itself into bit ones. Yeah, no, that was a good question. All right, so just a couple more things. Um, and we are, yeah, we're running out of, a couple more things. Okay, so there's there's a function called zeros um, that takes here. This is actually takes an argument. So here, so the, there's two two levels of parentheses. So the first level is calling the function zeros. And then the second level is giving it a tuple, uh, and the tuple is you know parentheses, comma parentheses, um, and we've seen this show up when we did the shape. Um, I didn't, and I'm putting it down. So a tuple is basically like a, a list, um, except it's immutable. So tuples you cannot change. Um, so so here we a tuple, ten by ten. So this gives me an array value. Of zeros, size ten by ten, or if I ones gives me an array of ones, um, and I can, or the other the other way of doing it, very similar is this function called zeros underscore like, where it takes an array and gives you an array that has the same shape and type, but it's full it's filled with zeros, and there's also a function called ones like, um, and so you can. Yeah, so, this, so if you want to create an empty array and then fill it out, this is how you do. Okay, the last thing I want to show you is um, matplotlib. So matplotlib is a very, very um, flexible 
active uh, library, which does plotting. So, so this and this is so this is more or less where we where I started. We're saying okay, this is yeah. So so where I started saying if you understand this, then and hopefully by now you understand most of it. Um, so again, we start with importing. So this is not built into Python. It's an external library, but it's it's um, very, very widely used. Matplotlib. Um, and here I can, I can, yeah, I, I just have this here so that, you know, it looks a certain way. So default style. And then, oops, sorry. sorry NP lin space. So this is a function that takes, it goes from minus four to plus four. And we want a, a total of a thousand elements linearly spaced. Um, and then, you know, we do, we plot X versus X square times cosine. Again, you have, you have, you have all of these standard functions, cosine, trigonometry, exponentials, logarithm. So those will all be built in them and they will work as you'd expect. They all work element wise as well. And here, and then I plot this versus that and I get this. Uh, actually, you know, if you, if you don't see the plot, there's, you might wanna, so this is more of a debugging thing. So for me, it just works. And I, for most people, it probably just works. But if you need to debug it, you might wanna say that you want the plots in line. In line, what in line means is that they show up on the notebook. So you're not saving them as a separate file. You're just, you're seeing them right there. Um, okay, this. okay, last thing is, all right. And actually I, I generally, generally don't use notebooks except for this one feature. So I actually like them a lot for teaching because I can mix text with code, but I don't use them on my day-to-day -day life, but except this one feature, which is actually, uh, which is it lets you do these very, very, very basic, um, you know, graphical user interface kind of thing is, they're very basic, but they're so easy, but they're very easy to do. So, so here, all right, let, let's do this, let's do this step-by-step. Step. So here, all right, so here we have a function, a function def, Function name takes an argument called power colon, and then it plots x to, to the square of the power times the cosine. And then what I've then added is so first of all I imported this interact function from IPy widgets, and so here, so here a slightly you know, so here I. I'm importing a specific name. So from something, import something. Um, I could, so this is shorthand for, for, for what we were doing before, we were importing a whole library like this. I could also have done it that way. But in this case, I'm just importing this one function. And then here, this is the at sign. And I say, I want to interact with this function and set, and where the power is from one to 10. And now I run this and now I have this. So here I can play around and just explore the parameters. And every time I move it, it's gonna redraw and do the thing. Um, you know, and, and this can do, you know, you can do, you can do a lot of complicated things, but generally speaking, Generally speaking, what the advantage of this is that it, it takes very little code, and there's a lot of things built in that are kind of trivial. But um, but you can do this exploration of parameters, and it gives you these little little graphical things where you can move. Oops. Yes, you can. Ah. All right, so. So, th so this is, for me, this is actually the best thing about notebooks, but, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned this before, if you don't like this notebook thing, don't use it. Um, there's a, a, a well-known talk on YouTube called, um, I don't like notebooks, uh, which was, which was one of the keynote talks, I think, or at least one of the invited talks at the, at the, Ju at the Jupiter conference. And, and there's, so there's a lot of reasons that, 
some people, it's really a personal thing. Some people really like it, some people don't. Um, as I said, I like it for teaching because, it, because of this mix of code and text. But you know, you can use you can use um, a text editor. I personally use uh, I now use NeoVim, but you can use Vim. You can use an IDE code. There's this spider, particularly for Python, which I think I have it installed. Uh, you can use the shell. You can you know, and and the language itself is still everything's the same. One of the few things that might change is one of the few things that might change is how you get help for for your functions. But other than that, everything kind of the same. Uh, so NumPy and Matplotlib and Python, they're all fairly extensively documented. So for example, NumPy, all of the, all of the functions, um, you know, so I, I've presented to you maybe, maybe 1%, just, but every, everything's kind of there um, on the website, Matplotlib, and here, you know, if you, I've, I've shown you this very basic plot that basically plots one thing versus the other. But you know, it you can get as complicated as you want. Um, you know, there's so he, here and then Python.org also has you know the basic language. So with that, I we have about two minutes to go before the schedule. Schedule. If there are any questions, yes, please. Yeah, a small question. Uh about uh, function shape and numpy, uh, so it's, uh, you don't use uh, parentheses after it, but usually it is Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Yeah, so, um, I'll just put here. Yeah, so you think, okay, shape. And actually I also showed D type. Um, yeah, so th this is because it's, this is not a method, this is just um, um, a property. So yeah, so objects can have methods that would do something, but they can also just have properties that, you know, that you just, you're, just basically, you're basically looking up something in the object, but there's no code actually executing, generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. All right, other than that, I think we're really on the dot. Um, so it's, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's lunchtime and lunch is upstairs. So it's in this building, but just you go up. Is that, I think that's correct. All right. Thank you, everyone.